Hello, hello, and welcome to another episode of The Hangry Mexican. Thanks for listening. You know, every time I uh, talk to a fellow journalist and get their perspective in life, see life through their lens, uh, I always have such a great time just learning something new. And uh, today's guest is just uh, amazing and uh, a superhuman to be doing everything that she's done in life and everything great that is coming her way. Uh, Priyanka Deo is my guest today. She uh, is a writer for WION, and she's also the anchor of the news show New India Junction, which you can... Uh, watch on YouTube, and you can also catch it on Instagram. I'm also going to include those links, of course, to the description of this podcast episode. But I uh, can't wait for you to hear this uh, interview. She just she is such a pleasure to talk to. And if you're not familiar with her, I think you're going to be after this podcast. She's been. From coast to coast, and even though we are uh, currently separated by uh, a few oceans and a time zone, you know, she's like 12 and a half hours uh, difference from me in here in Southern California. She's actually over in New Delhi, India, but through the power of technology, of course, we were able to get this interview done, and even though she was wrapping her day and I was starting mine, uh, we were able to meet in the middle Okay, well, without further ado, uh, here is Priyanka Deo. DJ, roll that music. (laughs) Uh, But no, thank you really for being a guest here on, on, on the podcast because I think, uh, <laughs> you know, I've, uh, I, I, this is the first time that I think we've actually talked to each other because we've never met, but I kind of feel like I know you based on just what I'm seeing on all pop up on my Instagram feed all the time, okay. <laughs> which is, yeah, <laughs> yeah, uh, new, new India uh, Junction, uh, What's that, and and how did you you know come across? Uh, how did you start doing that? A very very interesting story, actually. Um, I was at Harvard last year, uh, graduated in 2018, and um, got a sort of offer to come and work in India uh, for the election campaign. Uh, so we had uh, the prime minister's election going on uh, this year. And, uh, you know, I, I sort of moved uh, continents in uh, 2018 without having any plans of doing so. <laughs> um, kind of just packed my bags, moved over. And, uh, you know, while we were talking, uh, you know, I expressed that India really has a need for um, digital journalism. And that to 65% of our population right now in India is under the age of 35 years old. So uh, more and more people in our demographic, uh, in the Indian demographic, I should say, are turning towards digital media. And, uh, you know, India still prides itself, I would say, on old and traditional, I don't want to say old, but traditional forms of journalism, like print. Uh, Newspapers are very, very big. And, uh, you know, radio is very, very big. And television is still very big. But slowly we're seeing a change with more accessibility to cell phones, uh, to smartphones especially. And during this election campaign, we saw a big turnaround. So one of my ideas was to, uh, was actually a collaborative idea, was to kind of start a uh, YouTube channel that is directed towards the youth and deals with positive development around the country. Uh, Because news is always, people thrive on uh, watching bad news, right? So we wanted to kind of create the opposite. And uh, we said there's enough, uh, you know, negative news, news channels out there. Why not create a uh, YouTube channel that delivers positive but engaging content and see how it goes? And uh, we're still alive and kicking, so it's going well. <laughs> wow! No, that, that yeah, that's awesome. And you know, I'm not 
uh, I don't live in India. I'm not from India, but I really enjoy watching and getting to know the news of what's happening over there in India, especially uh, because it is positive news. I think uh, everything that you're showing on this um, digital show. Now, is there <clears throat> is there any channel when you when you say India, right? So you enjoy watching all the positive things going on. <laughs> yes, yes, and and being being in news myself, uh, it's it's um, yeah, you know, you're you're always hearing about all the negative things, but right. uh, I like I like hearing the positive, especially positives that are going on elsewhere in the world uh, too, and and see what we can learn here in the U.S. Uh, from that. Uh, and I think this show is just um, uh, really good. I have there ever have there ever been, there ever been any uh, talks about. Um, Maybe uh, uh, taking it to TV? Uh, so uh, that's actually very interesting. We had one of our uh, mini documentaries that we did. Um, we went to uh, a state in India called Uttar Pradesh. And uh, Prime Minister Modi, well, he was uh, running for election then. But um, it, his constituency is in that state. So when he had to file his nomination papers to run for prime minister, he had actually visited that state and we were there, uh, you know, kind of covering different districts of that state. And uh, mm -hmm. that program actually went on a major television channel in India. So, um, you know, with that, uh, I am the host and anchor and executive producer of this channel. So I was also called as an expert to a lot of the television debates. And uh, I think we were just talking before this interview, but I just got done with one and then rushed home so I could talk to you, Oscar. So oh, uh, kind of I really appreciate it. Oh, no, thank you for having me. Uh, but <laughs> just a lot of things kind of springboarded from the channel. And um, I'm really happy just because when you say, you know, people really want to know the positive. Uh, you know, I went to journalism school at Annenberg in L.A., uh, USC mm. Annenberg. And, uh, you know, it's it's a known fact that bad news always sells. And, uh, you know, it's just refreshing that as time goes on and as people are turning to digital streams and uh, just picking and choosing what they want to see and the content that they want to see, it's interesting to see the dynamics of just news and media change uh, in the last few years that people are choosing to see more positive content. Of course, they want to know what's going on in the world, but I think the stories that they choose are these feel-good stories. You know, when you're on the metro on your way to work or you're taking an Uber, you want to hear something good before you start your work day. Yeah, exactly. And, I, you know, I just saw um, a, a clip um last night about uh, cleaning the trash, which is, an, a, you know, a subject that, that we also are tackling over here in the U.S., how to deal with, with the trash that is left behind in beaches and, and um, that's you know, how to be more... I remember visiting those beaches. Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, and you got, you got uh, kids, you got um, celebrities. Uh, I mean, you did a very good job on that piece. How, how, how was that experience? Maybe you can talk to me a little bit about the, the process of taking this show on the, on the road, getting video out in the field versus staying in, you know, a studio, for example, and oh, doing everything from vital. there. And I think if, you know, you want to call yourself a journalist, you have to know how to do ground reporting. Um, and you have to somehow, Amen. you know, make yourself available to and make yourself approachable to people from all walks of life. Uh, so you, you know, you generally have to have a general interest in people, I think, to be a journalist. And if you, if you don't have that, if you just want to do your makeup and sit in a studio, um, you know, you're not going to be as successful as someone that kind of goes out in the field and on the ground, because uh, that's where the real stories are. And uh, people are unafraid of, you know, if you're an approachable person, I think people are unafraid of telling their story and they want their story to be heard. So, for example, this beach, um, it was terrible. We, I went at about, uh, you know, with my camera crew, I went there at about seven in the morning. And uh, now this city is Mumbai, which is surrounded by water, by and large, the Arabian Sea. And there is currently a festival going on. It is the uh, Ganesh Chaturthi Festival, um, which, uh, you know, the, the iconic part about Mumbai is that it has these four massive idols. And at the end, uh, they are submerged in the water uh, as part of uh, the Hindu tradition and culture. 
So what happens over here is that during these festivals, everyone has their small little idols at home and they want to submerge those idols too. Well, what happens there is all the chemicals from the paint that these idols have and the materials that these idols are made of and the plastic and everything, they all get thrown into that water year after year after year. And, you know, when I put my boots on and went, just, just went into one foot deep water in, in the, uh, you know, the Arabian Sea on that mm-hmm. beach, it was disgust. I saw dead fish. I saw, uh, you know, these plastic items sticking on my boots. I saw slime. I saw muck. And that was at, you know, seven in the morning uh, before the tide came in. So you can imagine when the tide came in, the amount of garbage, you know, they had all these celebrities and stuff come in. And it was a great effort because now they're doing it every single week. And about 100, 150, 200 people kind of come and the numbers have been growing. But um it, does, it was almost like we were cleaning the beach and then more garbage just rolled up. And then we were oh, geez. Up and more just rolled up, you know, so it was just kind of like, but I think citizens were aware, um, especially with celebrities and influencers there, that brings out a lot more people just because they want to meet the celebrities. And then if you're going to be at the beach anyway, you're going to clean and uh, go home. So every little bit helps. And I think uh, the most important part of that was the kids that were there. You know, we saw like three-year-olds, four-year-olds, cleaning. And I think, you know, just that culture of throwing things and dumping things. And India has a population of 1.3 billion people. So overpopulation is a thing. Um, You know, human waste is a thing. Animal waste is a thing. Just waste in general is a huge problem in the country. And uh, it's so easy to just dump it in the water where we can't see it. But now I think citizens are aware that, hey, you know, we can't keep doing this because this is disgusting. (laughs) So it was, yeah. <laughs> it was an eye-opening experience for sure. And, uh, you know, thank you for watching that because it's a problem everywhere in the world that has a beach, I would say. Yeah. No, well, I should say thank you because you're the one that's bringing the awareness of this uh, via the, um, you know, the the video, the, the all those visuals that that you're presenting on on these uh, digital platforms. Uh, I wouldn't have known, you know, I kind of did hear – that, that India had uh, this problem with trash, but I didn't know to the extent it went to until I saw your video and I'm just, my jaw dropped. <laughs> and that is, uh, that's just one of the beaches. So you can imagine the other, the other beaches. There's, there's many of them ju- and that's just in one state alone. So you can just imagine the amount of, you know, we can't even go into the water. Um, you know, I had uh, one instance where we have monsoons, right? So during the monsoons, mm-hmm. the water kind of comes up onto the road. It, uh, you know, there's, there's storms. The water's not calm at that point in time. But I remember I was rushing home and I was right by the coast of, uh, you know, where the water was in Mumbai. And I was on my way home. I remember just a little bit of water hit my arm. And my arm had this horrible rash, like the worst rash, oils, everything wow. possibly. And it was disgusting. And I was like, man, how dirty is this water? And it's all because of us. So, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, you saw one part of one beach, uh, like one small section of one beach. So you can imagine just what the actual problem is. Um, so I'm, I'm happy that you watched it. And I, I hope a lot of other people watch it as well. Oh yeah, no, definitely, and keep keep doing, uh, you know, the work. That's it's great, great work that you're doing, and that's that's one of the reasons yeah. why I also wanted to have you on as a guest because uh, I think the work that you're doing is very important. But at the same time, I wanted to know how the media is different over there in India and what you do versus here in the U.S. Um, uh, and maybe you can a lot uh-huh. of differences. I would say, um, I think that. Uh, You know, what I noticed is actually during the election campaign, I think the biggest lesson that I've learned is, uh, you know, in the United States, when you think of the presidential elections, um, I think that uh, American media, U.S. media, especially if we're if we're going to talk about it, um, you know, I've studied at uh, London School of Economics as well. I would go so far to say U.K. media as well. Uh, I think more hits and more views Uh, happen when there's a lot of organization. So when there's, you know, a presidential rally, it's always well organized. Media kind of have their space. Um, You know, they cover what they're supposed to cover. And uh, everyone kind of works together. Here, 
a lot of um, media hits and likes from people are uh, based on chaos. <laughs> um, so <laughs> it's almost as if you have to, you know, create a scene in order to, uh, in order for people to watch. Because the most successful videos that we have had are actually during uh, Prime Minister Modi's election campaign when we covered one of his rallies. And it was just crazy. We are, you know, we had ground reporters, they went out, we interviewed people that were dancing on the roads that were, um, you know, chanting that were doing all sorts of things. So we really got in there and, and started talking to them and asking them, you know, why they supported uh, Prime Minister Modi or why didn't they support him. And, uh, you know, those videos, we actually broke Twitter that day. I think uh, New India Junction did better than any of the media platforms um, just that day alone. So it was um, it was crazy. That was one of the biggest takeaways that I've learned. And I think we were talking about just debates that happen over here. A, a big difference that that I've noticed is uh, when you when you see a news channel or when you see a television debate in the United States, it's very, very well controlled. Even the presidential debates, I would say, even though they get very exciting at times and people get over emotional or candidates get uh, energetic at times, it's still by and large very well controlled. Over here, people thrive on the screaming, the as loud as you can, the <laughs> in your face, um, you know, the louder, the better, the more controversial you are, the better. That's what people thrive on over here. So uh, I think it's just um, if you're a player, play the game. Uh, it depends on which country you're on, but you got to go with what works. So um, very, very interesting differences. And it's completely opposite <laughs> of what I've learned to do in journalism school. It's almost like I have to unlearn it because I learned in the United States and now I have to learn uh, Indian media just on the spot going going forward. So it's interesting for sure. And it's a learning experience for me as well as I produce the videos. Oh, wow. Have you uh, bumped into any of, the, uh, of your American colleagues over there when they're covering something for US media, something that's happening in India, and then you, you kind of have to just give them tips? <laughs> I, I have, just, uh -huh. and you know, they get very, very overwhelmed uh, just because of the, the sea of people, which is something I struggled with as well. Um, you know, you just have to, you have to watch your back. You have to trust your cameraman. Uh, you know, it came to a point where, uh, you know, there was just a sea of people at one point in time and uh, the cameraman had his uh, camera on his tripod, right? So I, I could not find him and my colleague couldn't find her cameraman. And, um, you know, he just held the tripod up so that we could see that at a distance. Because <laughs> that was the only way he could get through us. You know, we were, he was trying to call us. We couldn't hear him. So he was like, I'm just going to hold the tripod up. Just, just follow it. So we were like, okay. And that's how we found each other. So I think it's just, uh, you know, it's hot. It's humid in India. It's the, the weather conditions are something that uh, people struggle with, including myself. You know, when you go out on the field, at least the females... We all have our makeup on. We all have our hair done. And that just completely, you know, I have very curly hair. So it completely turns into a lion mane by, by the end of the shoot because <laughs> of the humidity. So um, just some things, yeah, but very, very basic things. And, you know, I, I think journalists are very tough that way. They know how to kind of fight through whatever comes at them. So uh, they did a good job. But uh, tips are, you know, just, just keep calm and uh, different situation, different country. But um, fundamentals of journalism stay the same. So. Yeah. Now, when you go out and, uh, you know, do these stories, cover these stories, mm -hmm. uh, what, how do you prepare for that? You know, how do you, how do you get yourself kind of in that, in that zone before you go out to say, okay, okay, I, I got this. I know what to do. Oh, good question. That's something I struggle with every single story. Uh, see, the, I think the thing about ground reporting, right, versus in a studio is in the mm -hmm. studio, you can definitely do your research. And this is any studio across the world. You can do your research and you know the story, right? Um, but the thing with ground reporting is you really have to use your creativity on the spot because it's not just about creating the story, but new stories can come up on the ground. And that's happened to me all the time. Um, you know, for example, we went to Northeast India and now the Northeast is very, very underdeveloped. So they didn't even have, they had these refugee camps because there was a genocide that took place not too long ago. Those refugee camps had about 5,000 families in them. Um, and this was a story in itself. So we had planned to go and do the refugee camp. 
Uh, but then they had, uh, you know, a child bench taking place that the government was uh, kind of proactively doing. So that turned out to be a news story. And, um, you know, you just have to think on the spot and you just have to, uh, I think what makes a really great journalist from a good journalist is the ability to sort of relay that story in layman's terms so that somebody from a very, very rural background and somebody from, uh, you know, a Harvard living in Man in the middle of Manhattan can understand the same story and get the same takeaways out of it. So I think that it's not just creating the story, but you have to think about the cameraman. What shots do you need? What uh, angles do you need? Uh, who you're going to talk to? You have to run and get those people because they're doing their own thing most of the time. So I think that, you know, you definitely do have to do your research going in, know where you're going, know basically what's happening. But I think it's the creativity of the journalist and the team that kind of goes out there, covers the story, gets the bites, and does as much with the material that they have as possible. So um, it's an adventure every single time, which is why I love journalism and why I got in the field. And has there ever been a story where you just flat out say, I'm not doing that? <laughs> Um, I think, uh, well, initially you're kind of like, is it safe? Is it not safe? Now we just recently went to Kashmir and, uh -huh. um, you know, if, if you're, if you've been reading Indian news, uh, you know, article 370 and article 35A of the Indian constitution have been abrogated and uh, amended. And now Kashmir has finally become a part of India, but it was, um, uh, it's, it was under controversy for almost seven decades. Uh, because there was, uh, Pakistan is involved, um, China is involved in Kashmir. So it was just this topic of debate for years and years and years. And for the first time, uh, you know, it's, it's completely under India. So we went to uh, Kashmir and uh, it's actually, you know, when we landed um, the entire place, because the articles have just been abrogated, uh, you know, it's, it's just so fresh. The issue is just so fresh that everything was kind of shut down. So I had my reservations about going there because I was like, is it going to be safe? Are we going to be okay? Is my team mm -hmm. going to be okay? Um, you know, you've had instances, nothing is, um, you know, liability is, is, uh, is something that journalists have to deal with all the time. And in India and in an area where there has been a lot of violence in the past, you're always very skeptical of going there. So I was very apprehensive. And on top of that, uh, communication and cell phones uh, were not working in uh, in the district that we went to, which was uh, Srinagar. So uh, we had no cell phone. We had no landline that was working, no internet uh, in, in the time that we were there. But, um, you know, I, I don't think I flat out said no. I think that kind of uh, lifts the adrenaline in me and I kind of want to go just to see how it is. So um, the worst thing you can do is uh, say no to a story. I think... Uh, um, you know, because otherwise you'll never know the answer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, and I'm, and I'm sure that uh, you you get so many compliments all the time from just your colleagues, the community, your family, your friends. How do you um, not let all of those praises get to your head <laughs> oh, and yeah. create this big them. ego? I was, you know, I was just thinking of my mom. Uh, and my dad and they're, you know, they're the biggest supporters of me. And, uh, you know, the, the first thing that they say is, is definitely not a compliment. It's definitely a, you could have done this better or <laughs> I'm working on this a little bit, you know, so you have that joy of finishing the story and putting it out there. And, you know, I've had stuff go viral and uh, stuff coming on TV all the time. And, uh, you know, then you have your mom and dad saying, well, you know, you could have fixed your hair. Your makeup could have been a bit better. You know, when you could, like increase your eye contact a little bit or look this way or ask the question this way. And, um, you know, I, I think that I have, I'm very lucky to have a group of friends who, which makes all the difference, um, you know, where my, my cohort mates and my, my classmates and my peers uh, in journalism, whether they be from Harvard, whether they be from USC Annenberg, uh, whether they be from uh, LSE in London, whether they be from college, I think the, the people that have stayed really close to me as friends are my biggest supporters, but they're the first ones that will tell me what I need to work on. And um, I'm the same way with them. So I don't, I don't know the last, 
the last time I've gotten a compliment outright, I can't even remember because it's always been like the video is good, but if you do this, it can be better. So <laughs> um, it's definitely helped me stay grounded. And I know that this circle of people want me to get better and want the videos to do better and want my work and my progress as a journalist to just keep increasing and keep going upward. So I, I think I'm just the luckiest person in the world where I'm just getting after every video, I'm getting people that just give me a ton of feedback <laughs> more than anything else. So um, yeah, whether you ask it, or, you, what, I'm definitely not used to <laughs> to answer your question. <laughs> No, that's uh, you know I, I've I often say that the parents are the first to uh, keep you grounded because oh, they're yeah. the first ones to criticize you for your work. But yeah, you're right. You know, it's not a bad thing. I think I think you are definitely right that you know it's important to have that that balance in life because it's really easy to get your ego inflated if all you hear is compliments all the time so you you think you're doing everything correct every single time that you're perfect and and you know as we all know that's not that's not the case so it's really important to have these people in your life it's it's the people that i don't know and you know the strangers on the on the videos or, or those viewers that watch the videos that you know say great job and this is great work and this is but all the people that are close to me that i know of are like Hmm, well, the editing could have been better or you could have maybe walked this way. So it's I'm just so not used to actually getting a compliment for my work ever since grad school that um, it's, it's kind of funny. I, I never thought of that. So. <laughs> All right, so let's let's switch gears just a little bit uh, because we, t- we you mentioned this earlier. You were uh, part of a debate tonight, uh, and uh, just for everybody listening, uh, we're uh, twelve and a half hours apart from each other. Oh, but yeah. thank you to technology, uh, you know, we we're making this interview happen. So um, you yeah. know, I'm just waking up, but you're practically done with your day, I and you were have- just similarity of our cappuccino right next to us i have my cappuccino <laughs> right here so yeah and i have my coffee here with with pumpkin spice cre- oh, flavored creamer that time of the year i am jealous that's what <laughs> have over here uh we have starbucks here but they have different flavors so i will share uh, what the specialty is here in a couple of weeks Ooh, okay. Okay. Well, are you a big pumpkin spice fan? I wa- yeah, I wa- I totally miss it. When you said pumpkin spice, I was like, "Oh, man. <laughs> I definitely <laughs> definitely miss my Starbucks in the US for sure." <laughs> Oh yeah, you know, I I have uh, pumpkin spice cereal, pumpkin spice bagels, <laughs> pumpkin cream cheese. Thanks, Oscar. Thank you for rubbing it in. <laughs> <laughs> We'll have to send you a care package with all this stuff. I would love that. You would be my favorite person in the world. No joke. But it's so funny because, you know, not a lot of people uh, like pumpkin spice. I mean, there's, you got, you either like it or you don't. There's, there's almost like no middle ground depending on uh, where you live or where you're from. Uh, But, uh, uh uh-huh. Begin to miss it when it's just not available, right? Like you just, you're just like, oh man, now I want it. Yeah, exactly. Um, but yeah, going back to the uh, debate just real quick. So you were part of this debate. You were um, you were in it, and how was that experience like? Uh, so it it happens uh, every, I would say, pretty frequently. Uh, I'm I'm kind of called as a an expert uh, to uh, television debates over here. Uh, like I said, the, the format is, is very different. They have, uh, you know, anywhere from three to uh, eight members uh, uh, that, that come from all professions, all walks of life, uh, different viewpoints, different angles, and you have one anchor. And, um, you know, we, we just talk about the topic at hand and, and they normally deal with uh, current events or, uh, you know, I, I used to play tennis in, in the past. So uh, today was actually a sports discussion. And uh, we were talking about Rafael Nadal and how he's just won his 19th U.S. Open or 19th Grand Slam title through the U.S. <laughs> Open. So I was watching that match and in India, it came on at about 1.30 in the morning. So um, I've, uh, this is why I need the coffee. <laughs> this is why I'm craving the pumpkin spice right now. But uh, <laughs> we're talking about that. Uh, but I've also gone on debates where we've spoken about the elections. 
Um, I've gone on debates where we've spoken about the prime minister, his viewpoint on certain things, um, the economy, development in India. Uh, the prime minister has coined this term called New India. Uh, and uh, India has seen a lot of changes under his leadership uh, because he was prime minister before for five years. He's just started a new five-year term now. And, uh, you know, he, he wants India to move towards a new India, which is a more developed India, a more inclusive India, uh, and a more accessible India. So a lot of topics kind of center around that, especially nowadays with the new government. Uh, parliament session, the monsoon session has just gotten over. Uh, so out of the, I think, 36 bills that were presented, 34 of them have gotten passed. Um, so it's a lot of discussion based on those because now they've gone to the Supreme Court and now they're being argued out and, and spoken about and uh, Supreme Court's called on the central government to say, hey, what do we do about this? A lot of interesting things going on um, and really interesting for me to see um, how a new government is sort of forming and what they're doing uh, you know, to, to lay out their basically next five-year roadmap plan. So it's very, very exciting to see because I have, uh, despite being of Indian origin, I've grown up in the United States by and large. And the only times I used to come to India were, you know, for the month to visit my family. And the last thing I used to do was watch the news. So um, to kind of be hurled into that process and to see all of these changes take place firsthand um, and to, you know, just have the luck of New India Junction being able to cover some of these things. We've gone into the prime minister's house as well and uh, covered uh, the, uh, a piece on the economy and uh, MSMEs, which are micro, small, and medium-sized enterprises. Uh, you know, it's, it's just been a fascinating experience. So um, to kind of do these debates is, uh, is wonderful because not only are you out there debating your viewpoint, but you're also learning all different types of viewpoints that are foreign to me, that are, that are new to me, um, because I've not grown up with it. So it's um, it's definitely a learning experience, and you you come out in the in the night, and you're just like, huh, that's interesting. So, <laughs> and uh, are these the debates where everybody's yelling at each other? Yeah, they. Oh, yeah. So that that's something that's different too. As I said before, India thrives on uh, Indian media. I would say viewership thrives on a lot of chaos and a lot of action going on, a lot of in your face. So it's it's just not. Um, you know, like a polite sort of you make your viewpoint and I make mine. It's like, hey, if I disagree with you, I'm going to speak up and I'm going to speak up now. And I don't care if I'm interrupting you. So um, it's especially when we deal with political topics, um, it can get pretty heated and intense. And we, you know, I've screamed at the other person as well. They've screamed back at me. And uh, it's it's been fun. It's been a ride for sure. <laughs> <laughs> how do you so under those situations how do you stay you know c calm enough that you're not losing control that you're not getting you know <laughs> angry and upset like how do you how do you control that uh so i okay well i've been lucky i've done policy debating in uh high school and um policy debating in the u.s is a really big thing you can get nationally ranked so i learned early on to you know it can get pretty heated uh don't lose your cool because when you lose your emotions, um, that's when your arguments, that's when you say things that you, that you just don't want to say. That's when you start getting personal. And um, that turns people off completely. And that's what you just don't want to do. You want to make your point. You want to be powerful. You want to be strong. But you also want to be concise and you want to stick to your point. You don't want to get into, you know, oh, your top is really ugly during a debate, which some people do. So um, I think that you just have to, the thing that really, really helps me is, uh, you know, I always go in, even though I know the topic from, uh, if I know it in my head, if I'm confident about the topic, um, I still have like a, a piece of paper with, with just the notes that I, that I want. And um, I tend to take a, a tennis ball with me everywhere I go. Not many people know this, but um, I have a bag and I have a purse and I always have a tennis ball or a squishy toy that I can just press. Uh, and I, I keep that at the bottom of the table. And when I feel myself just losing my cool, I keep pressing that. And that's just been a habit I've had since high school. Um, it's just a reminder in my brain, don't get too emotional. Don't get angry. Make your point and win on that point. Don't, uh, you know, don't win on uh, insulting somebody else. Wow. I love that. <laughs> uh, I should try that sometime too. Give away my secret. 
<laughs> my elixir. <so. laughs> but it's it's uh it's really interesting that it's a tennis ball. So you you, you yeah. said you uh, were a tennis player professional. Yeah, I, I played the juniors uh, in the U.S. Uh, I started at the age of six. And, um, you know, I, I played nationals in the United States. I played uh, NCAA for college. I captained my college team at Illinois, uh, got a full ride. Um, and uh, instead of going pro, I decided to play for college. So I uh, played tennis almost, uh, what, 20, 25 years of, of my life? Or tw- No, no, that's wrong. I'm, I'm terrible at math, by the way. That's why I did <laughs> Um, I think maybe uh, I would say at least 22 years and counting uh, that I've that I've played the sport uh, internationally ranked, nationally ranked in the U.S. Um, had had a ton of fun, um, and uh, I think that that you know when I used to get stressed as a kid uh, or when I was nervous during a match as a kid, uh, I used to always take a tennis ball and squeeze it because uh, that was the only thing available. <laughs> so. Um, I think, uh, that habit has just stayed and now I just, you know, like a crazy lady carry a tennis ball everywhere. <laughs> my work desk has a tennis ball. My desk at home has a tennis ball. Um, you know, my purse has a tennis ball in it. So, um, just, uh, just to stress, it's like that fidget, uh, fidget spinner, whatever you call those things. <laughs> That's my, my version of a fidget spinner. So... <laughs> Well, now that things have gotten a little bit more stressful than when you were in high school, or I mean, I don't know. Would you say high school was more stressful than what I you have it now? Was terrible. <laughs> I think everyone can really. I mean, I feel I was. You know, I I never had problems of being popular and not popular, but high school was just very very stressful because I was I was doing policy debate at the time. I was playing tennis at the time uh, competitively. You know, trying to roadmap your career. Uh, those are your formative years in high school, um, especially if you're playing a sport. Um, you know, you're you're between the ages of 14 and 18, and uh, 16 at that time was when you could decide to go pro uh, for tennis. So I was always, you know, there was a lot of pressure even as a freshman and a sophomore for me because you were entering tournaments over your weekends. So my weekends would just go into playing tournaments or traveling for tournaments or going for a policy debate tournament. Or and then waking up on Monday and having to you know do homework and I would take being um uh, I I had typical Asian parents so they expected nothing less than I should say stereotypical they expected nothing less than you know straight A's uh you know perfection so I I was taking AP classes I was doing science fair at the time as well I was uh, playing tennis I was doing policy debate at a national level uh, for both and an international level for tennis. So it was crazy. I didn't even know what I was doing half the time. And when when you talk about lion mane hair, I think I had that all the time. So that's probably why I never had boyfriends in high school because I was just too crazy looking at that time probably. (laughs) Uh, Well, and very busy with everything else. You know, I remember a time when um, I was – uh, uh, I was going to college and I was working two jobs and one of them actually was overnight. And oh, wow. uh, yeah, it was. Uh, so in college, I had um, I was a full time what they call. So, you know, up to I think it was 18 units. And you had uh, w- wow. Yeah. Yeah. It was yeah. Uh, I, I did that for. <laughs> well, I did that for about a year, I think, year and a half. And because uh, I, I also. Um, uh, had uh, taken classes through the summer just so I could finish up uh, and and you know get that done and over with. But uh, I, I mean, I can I can relate. It was just uh, it was work, work, work in in school and in my other jobs, and I don't even know how I got through. Quite honestly, I mean, I know I took I naps, but all the time, right? Like you're just on it. All the, there's no stop to like getting off and breathing, right? You're just kind of on it. <laughs> And you just kind of deal with it. You get used to that level of stress, which is, you know, after college, when you kind of that phase before you start your job and, and uh, you finish college, you're kind of like, what do I do with my time now? <laughs> <So>. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And honestly, you know, I think I think you're, you're right. Like if it is it is pretty stressful when you have to go through all that. But I think just being in the line of work I am now, which is in the news industry, I, I it's kind of helped me deal with with, uh, you know, the stress. Uh, A lot better than if I hadn't gone through that, I feel. Yeah. Um, No, I I totally agree with you there. And I think that sport has also gotten me through uh, because sport always teaches you to, uh, 
work fast and think fast under pressure. And I think being in the news industry, especially, you really have to make those quick decisions as to, um, you know what I'm talking about, right? Like, uh, oh, yeah, it happens every single minute and it has to be on the minute on time, uh, you know, as per the second. So I think that uh, it's it's definitely tennis has definitely helped me out there because making those decisions uh, have just become, you know, it's like second nature because I've been doing it since I was six, seven, eight years old. Right. So Mm -hmm. uh, definitely helps you out. I think all those experiences, uh, especially working long hours, stressing yourself out in high school and college um, just teaches you to be a stronger person. It's like what what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Right. So. (laughs) Exactly. Well, you know, let's let's rewind the clock a little bit and let's let's talk about how you got into uh, journalism, you know, because you were it seems to me like you were on track to be something else in life. But how did you decide journalism is what uh, I'm going to be doing? Uh, I actually, you know, I think I knew it all along, but I didn't get into it until very recently, which is interesting. So I. um I played tennis, as, as I told you before, um, you know, thought about uh, going pro at one point in time, but played for college instead. After college, uh, I came back to India thinking that I wanted to do law. Um, and with law, you have to kind of practice or you have to study where you want to, uh, where you want to practice in the country that you wanted to practice. So I had always visited my family in India. It had always been fun. And I thought, you know, I I was like, I've never lived in India for more than a month or two or three months at a time. And I kind of wanted that experience uh, of living in India and seeing. So I entered into law school in India upon graduation, uh, after graduating from Illinois. And uh, with law school, I interned with Business India magazine. Um, And I was a financial uh, and features uh, sort of journalist over there. So wasn't getting paid in journalism, but kind of getting into how to write properly. And that helped me through, uh, you know, my law classes as well. Uh, Ended up not liking law as much um, and uh, then applied to London School of Economics for a master's degree in uh, media and communications again. In London, I basically uh, interned with... uh, couple of media places. And uh, they, you know, I think the situation in London at that time, economically, it was very hard to get visas and to work over there. And I honestly, the weather in London got to me, it was cloudy all the time. Um, I remember having tally marks in my room counting like the cloudy days. And when my friends would visit my room, uh, they would say, man, it's like you're living in a prison, like t- t- uh, you know, tallying every single day that where there's no sun. So I was like, yeah, man, this city is awful. So I just didn't like living in uh, in London, but I, through LSE, I got, I was lucky enough to get a fellowship to USC and um, did the master's in journalism at USC, uh, Southern California. And Annenberg, uh, USC Annenberg is the best journalism school in the world. Uh, it's ranked number one by far. And um, after that, I had too many student loans to get into journalism on a journalist salary. So even after that, I did not get into journalism. I got into crisis communications consulting in D.C. Uh, and then I worked in intelligence for a while and uh, ended up hating both of those. But uh, they helped pay off my uh, my loans and, and kind of lower them. And I've always also it's been my dream to go to Harvard since I was a little girl. So I was like, you know, I hate what I'm doing. I think I need the transition now. Um, Applied to Harvard, got in, uh, and then used that to slowly transition into journalism. Um, I uh, created opportunities for myself being my third master's degree, um, you know, to kind of set myself up to get into uh, journalism upon graduating. So uh, I had a show in Boston uh, on community television uh, it was called uh, Education Talk, and we dealt with uh, education issues all over Cambridge and Boston, uh, covered the Boston Marathon, uh, got an internship with NPR over there, uh, which taught me a lot of things, allowed me to do a lot of pieces uh, that got published as well. And um, then upon graduating, I think a uh, semester before, I got this just out of the blue incredible offer to kind of start my own, uh, my own channel. So I was like, heck yeah, I'm going to do that. So whether it be in India, whether it's in the U.S., I don't care. 
I think this is really exciting. And I finally, finally, finally got into journalism after three master's degrees and uh, how many jobs? Like three, four jobs, three, three or four years worth of work experience. So here I am. Well, you know, I, I wish you were right here in front of me because as you were saying all this, my jaw just kept hitting the floor. I mean, you've been so busy. What in the world? <laughs> been, uh, the days have gone by very quickly. I told you, right? It's like being on that struggle bus constantly. You're just on it all the time. So. <laughs> <laughs> you've done, I feel like you, I feel like you've done more things than uh, a regular person would. <laughs> uh, well, I am a regular person. I think it's just uh, you know I I feel Oscar. The problem is, uh, look, I I speak to many of my friends, and uh, you know when someone tells me, like I said, I'm not used to getting a compliment, but when someone tells me, look, you're so inspiring, you're so this, the fundamentals of it, are, you know, it's a very simple thing. If you're not happy in your situation, change it, you know, like just go out mm -hmm. there and change it. You can walk, you can. And fortunately, I've grown up in a country like India where I have seen people suffer and suffer very, very badly. You know, I've seen people um, not get the same resources, not have people living on the road, not ever having seen a home in their life, people sleeping on just the footpath, considering that their home. And, um, you know, when you see things like that, you really get very, very humble and, uh, you know, you learn to max out every single opportunity in front of you. Um, and with that, uh, if you have that sort of mindset, um, and on top of that, I'm, I'm a very competitive person. So I think, uh, you know, every opportunity that's come my way, I consider myself just very, very lucky to even have those opportunities. Um, you know, and my parents, moved to the United States. We started from scratch. We've seen hard times. We've seen good times. Uh, everything worked out in the end. But I think those experiences are very humbling. And, and more than anything, it just teaches you to not be lazy because you only have really one shot. I mean, it's, it's very cliche to say you just have one shot at life, but you do. There's no point being unhappy if you're, if you're unhappy. Just, just change your situation because Max once you get started on changing your situation, it's not going to take you that much time to change it and get to where you want to go. And that's just something I've always grown up with doing and something I'll continue to do. Wow. And are your parents uh, now living in India there with you? Oh, they're having fun. So they, they retired and they are, uh, they do half and half. Uh, they are enjoying um six months in the United States. I've grown up in Chicago. So you know what the weather, well, you're from LA, so you don't know what the weather's like in Chicago. But, uh, <laughs> Very cold, I assume. <laughs> terrible, terrible winters. Uh, but I think they skip the winters and they stay in India, which is a tropical country during the, the winter months. And when the weather starts getting good, they go to Chicago and enjoy with their friends. So I am, um, you know, I'm really, really happy for them because they've worked really hard to kind of give me the opportunities that I've had. Um, and it's really nice to see them enjoying life together, uh, you know, upon retiring and having fun. So they are half and half. And half the time, I, I don't even know. They're, they're kind of like, well, I'm here. Or I'm in Chicago right now. <laughs> or, uh, you know, hey, we're back in India. Come visit us. So <laughs> they're, they're fun people. Uh, so did, did you say you uh, were raised in the United States? I was, yeah. I, uh, I was born in India, uh, moved to the U.S. when I was about four years old. But always, uh, you know, because my, my parents uh, always traveled back to India, which is one of, I feel, the most valuable things for me that they did. Um, so my mom used to visit uh, the family once, once every year for a month. Then my dad used to visit once every year for a month. And, uh, you know, with one parent in the household, uh, I couldn't be left alone, right? So I got to go twice a year <laughs> to India. <Whoa>. And, uh, <laughs> nice. yeah, funny girl. and then during the summers, I, uh, I wanted to go as well. So that's a three-month summer break, summer vacation that you go. And then two months, so almost five months of the year, I was uh, spending time with my family in India. And that was one of the best things that, um, you know, my parents could have done for me. Uh, even when resources were tight, you know, my parents always bought my ticket and, and made sure that I, that I went to meet my family. So I never lost track. I never lost my culture. I never lost my language uh, skills. And um, I have a lot of friends in India. So I think the transition 
for me to, you know, just kind of jump ship and move continents was not as difficult as uh, some of my Indian friends who've grown up in the United States completely, but, you know, didn't go to India as, as frequently as I did. Um, you know, they're very uncomfortable moving into these situations and these circumstances. But for me, I think uh, definitely a lot of challenges that I face. There's definitely differences where, uh, you know, I miss the U.S. on uh, quite a few occasions, I would say. But um, I think that that's just, you know, when you know the language, you know uh, just how to get around, how to be independent. I think that is the most valuable thing that my parents have given me. So um, grown up in the U.S. completely, but never lost track and never lost sight of what my roots are. Wow. Uh, you know, I, you totally anticipated what I was going to ask you. And you just <laughs> answered my question before I even asked it. There you go. Uh, <laughs> well, I, so <laughs> I got you. I, I, <laughs> no, I, I, I think that's uh, really important. You know, my, my I'm the first generation um, uh, here in the U.S. My parents, both of them come from Mexico and and, you know, they had to start from scratch as well here in the U.S. And and um, at the same time had to keep that culture alive too. I, mean, I grew up, my first language is Spanish. And then I, you know, I learned English later on in, yeah. in school and all that. But um, yeah, it's, it's, I think it's just super important to, to understand where your roots are. I think it's just, you know, even no matter which place you're from, um, you know, I've, I've had friends who are very well exposed, who've been in the United States their, their entire life. Right. Um, but I think that um, it's just the willingness, you know, I think when you when you stay true to your roots and you also kind of have that willingness to go out there and explore um, what's not uh, so at home for you. Right. Like you kind of uh, it's not just being a journalist. I think it's it's just uh, when you know your roots and when you know where you come from, it's uh, it's from the line. I just saw the Lion King recently. So I, I think I've been quoting lines from it over and over again to my friends. But, you know, like when Mufasa says, uh, or Rafiki, sorry, he says, you know, you can't know where you're going unless you know where you, you come from. I think it's just uh, when you know your roots, no matter where they are, no matter, you know, if you, if you know them and if you take the time to understand them, your people, your culture, your traditions, you'll definitely appreciate the differences and also the similarities in other cultures and other traditions. And you have a new respect for people uh, whereas if you didn't really know where you came from, you wouldn't have that respect or reservation or a viewpoint that you would have uh, if you did. So I think that's where the value comes. Yeah, yeah. Well, and, and out of all the things that you've uh, you know done so far in life, uh, what has been the, the scariest thing for you to jump on? You know, because a lot of people... Yeah out there, they, they may be just afraid to say yes to a, a job or, uh, you know, move to a different city because they're just, there's this fear of the uncertainty. So what has that been for you? You know, I, I wouldn't even say any of those things. I, I don't think, hmm, that's an interesting question that you ask, Oscar. Um, I think when... I think the scariest thing for me all throughout, um, you know, be it a, a 14 year old playing a, a national match or be it, you know, moving to DC to start my first day. Um, it's always been sort of that, um, I've always carried a sense of, uh, I would say, uh, I wouldn't call it non-confidence or unconfidence or low confidence. But always that self-doubt, um, that's been, I think, the scariest thing for me. Um, you know, when they say you're your own worst enemy, uh, mm -hmm. I've always, be maybe because I'm so competitive, maybe because I'm so critical of myself, um, the biggest challenge for me in life has by far been uh, getting over that hurdle of doubting myself or doubting that you know, I can do this. I can reach where I want to go. Um, it was as recently as, you know, getting into Harvard, I, I had, I carried that self-doubt with me because even at Harvard, I was like, oh my gosh, everyone is smarter than me. Um, you know, what am I doing here? Uh, so it was as recent as, you know, 2018. And I think that 
um, you know, I, I just, what I, what I did to kind of overcome it was, um, you know, I cut out a lot of the people in my life that were negative influences on me or that had ever made me feel really bad. Um, you know, and, and scarily, some of those people are people who are very close to you, right? Some of those people can be, um, you know, in, in some instances, they can be family members, they can be friends that you've known for a really long time. Um, they can be people who are in definitely in your inner circles. So what I what I did was just kind of cut that negativity out. And I surrounded myself with with people that inspired me with people that made me feel good. Um, with people that had interesting things to say that were doing their own things in life. And, um, you know, when you kind of hang around with those people, especially when you have that self doubt in you, that's still there, your perspective sort of changes because you get inspired by not what they're doing. You get inspired by just their outlook. Um, and that's when I started changing my perspective because I realized that those people were really inspired by me as well and the things that I was doing. And I was like, well, hey, if they can be so awesome and they think that I'm awesome, why don't I think that I'm awesome too? And, you know, that's when I was just like, no, I can do it. I can be what I want to be. And I, you know, I, I can go where I want to go. And that is, there's still miles to go. There's still a miles and miles and miles to go and mountains to climb. But I know for sure now that I'm going to get there. So when you talk about the scariest thing, that definitely has been something I have struggled with my entire life. Um, still struggle to this day, but uh, now I think I've overcome it and I've, I've, you know, garnered some techniques to just, uh, you know, get over it and, and have a very positive outlook every single day. It takes active, uh, you know, you really have to train your mind to, to just think in the right way. So um I guess does that answer your question? <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, it does. Awesome. Uh, it, <laughs> uh, so if you could, if you could go back in time uh, with with everything that you've learned so far, or all the knowledge that you've gained, you know, just just walking through life, doing what you do, um, what would you tell? What would you tell your younger self to make just the transitions in life a little easier and less? Um, you know, scary, if you will. Well, I think it just goes back to my, my old point. I, and I, you know, I keep, um, you know, there was a point where I used to keep thinking about when I was younger, um, you know, what I could have done differently or what I could have said differently or what actions I could have taken differently. And people never really saw, you know, they were like, it's so unlike, it's so unlike you. A lot of my friends call me pre, uh, just as a nickname, But they were like, Pri, it's so unlike you to feel nervous. It's so unlike you to feel scared. It's so unlike you to feel, um, you know, low self-esteem about yourself or low confidence when you're entering into something. Um, it's so unlike you to cry. Um, and I think when I look at my younger self, I, um, I would definitely tell myself, look, it's okay to feel all those things. It's okay to, um, you know, it's okay to fail. It's okay to make mistakes but realize that you're doing a really good job. Um, I think I'd be a little easy on myself. Um, you know, and I, I tell myself to just, you know, you're, you, at the same time, it's important to, I would say, be critical and to just uh, know what you could have done better. But at the same time, I feel it's as important to affirm to yourself that, hey, I gave it my best and next time it's just going to be better. And that's something I never did growing up. That's something I never did through my grad schools. That's something I never did through work. That's something I never did in tennis. Um, it was always like, you know, you're awful. You need to improve. You're awful. You need to improve. You made these mistakes get better. It was never, hey, you're doing a good job. Breathe, you know, enjoy yourself a little bit more. You're doing this because you love it. Um, I think that I would definitely tell my younger self, to make it a point to just affirm yourself and, and, you know, go in the right direction, but just be a little positive and be a little easy on yourself as well, because it's, it's, it's part of the journey. You got to have fun. <laughs> well said. <laughs> <laughs> I so, think uh, I'm doing that now, so <laughs> better late than <laughs> ever, right? Yeah, exactly. And you know, you, you're still, you're still, um, 
uh, writing your own story? There's still a lot of miles left. And is there anything that, that you're kind of looking forward to that, that maybe maybe some projects that, that you want to do in the future, maybe some other platforms you want to explore? Is there anything like that? Um, I definitely do want to explore other platforms. Um, in terms of projects, you know, projects keep coming up on a day to day basis and always look forward to those, you know, getting to know new people, getting to know new situations, new environments, new points of view. Um, but I think that, um, and maybe you can relate to me, you're also in news. I think mm -hmm. that, you know, everyone says that the future of journalism is digital, right? But yes. what after that? Um, what happens to, Post digital, what are people going to be into? How are people going to be consuming the news? And I definitely think that, you know, within the next few years, virtual reality is going to be a big thing. People will not just want to be a part of the news and to click buttons and be interactive. People want to feel the news. People would want to, you know, be a part of the news. Um, if there's a presidential election going on or if candidates are talking, I think people will want to feel that, uh, you know, in a virtual reality setting. So I definitely want to bring some of those ideas to India. Um, I definitely want to introduce some of those ideas into journalism because I think that that is the future of news. And I think that that is the future of media and people's attention spans are getting shorter and shorter. So what is the way that you're going to keep them engaged? It's when they can feel things. It's when they can you know, see, see something that they can't really relate to, like a rhino in Africa. If they see it, if they can, you know, if it's right in front of them, they'll understand the story better. They'll be able to feel it. They'll be able to experience the entire story. And I think that's where the future of journalism is heading post-digital. Um, and that's something I definitely want to bring to India, my country, um, and, uh, you know, hopefully around the world. And hopefully I get great journalists like you to come on board and help out in that effort. <laughs> oh, I would love to. You know, at this at this point in my life, I've learned that uh, uh, to try new things. That that being being afraid to try something that you hadn't before and you don't know how it's going to turn out. I mean, you can only get a. Uh, uh, um, the the best uh, guesstimate of what would happen, but yeah. uh, you know, make an educated decision and and just kind of do it. And uh, you know, what the is the worst that could happen? Yeah. And then you go home, and then you have an ice cream, right? That's the worst. Oh, that <laughs> yes, I know vanilla ice cream. That's my favorite. Oh man, it's got to be chocolate. Come on. <laughs> oh it's well, I. <laughs> <laughs> cookies and cream well you know that's another one what i actually do with cookies and cream ice cream is i throw i throw in the blender throw a few scoops in the blender put a little bit of uh, milk and then just blend it and have a cookies and cream ice cream shake oh man <laughs> well that's spice. what i can definitely do here i can't have pumpkin <laughs> spice over here but i can definitely go and do that and i think you know though it's uh what time is it like 10 something over here at night I think I'm going to go do that because I have some nice cookies and cream ice cream in my freezer right now. Oh, man. <laughs> You're making me hungry now. There you go. Uh, <laughs> one of the things I love about food is just dessert. I mean, I love all kinds of food, but dessert, I mean, that's still my favorite. Uh... <laughs> I just love dessert. You know, it's, uh, food is okay, but just the, the dessert needs to come right in front of me. No, I'm actually, you know, I'm the opposite. I can have... Uh, I can actually skip the ice cream and the sweet, but if you give me like a bag of chips or my favorite, <laughs> like if you give me flaming hot Cheetos, Ooh, I will eat yes. like four bags of those straight up. Like it's just, I, I don't even know how I do it. And like my stomach will just be like, stop it, stop it, stop it. <laughs> but I'll just keep going. <laughs> so I think chips is my nemesis. I think savory items, like savory junk food is definitely my uh, my nemesis for sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it, it's uh, I, I, yeah, I definitely try and stay uh, away as much as possible. But every now and then, like you crave it, and yeah, flaming hot Cheetos. Oh, I love those. Bag. Not not just that small bag. You need like that big, you know, like three dollar bag, right? Where you <laughs> where there's just a bunch of chips in there, and that's your dinner for the night. Yeah, the family size bag. Uh -huh, the family size. There you go. <laughs> Oh uh, well, Priyanka. Before we end the uh, uh, the podcast, uh, I just want to give you the opportunity to say something and the podcast with something that maybe we haven't talked before about. Uh, just something that you want to leave our listeners with. 
Um, yeah, I think, uh, you know, it's uh, just want to tell people that, you know, even the, the greatest of all, uh, you know, the most successful, we all have our idols that we look up to. But you know what? The greatest people are also just human beings. Um, you just have to understand that they go through the same emotions you do. They go through the same struggles you do. And as an anchor and as, you know, meeting a ton of people on my channel, I've seen what they go through. And it's very similar to what you and I go through every single day. So if I have any advice for uh, or if I you know, can solicit any knowledge to, to anybody listening out there, I think just, you know what, have faith in yourself and don't be lazy. Just max out your opportunities because <laughs> if you, you know, if you go for it and if you actually take action on your dreams, it's not that difficult to get there. You'll find a way. But, you know, if you're if you just dream about it, it's just going to remain a dream. Um, so I think just go for it because there's no such thing as a great person. They've taken a lot of blood, sweat and tears to get there. And if they can do it, you guys can do it, too. Well, Priyanka, I loved that you were a guest on here today. It was amazing talking to you and you getting so your much. point of view. I had so much fun. Um, I, I, you know, I apologize. I think uh, I, I was like, but I'm not Mexican before because the name of your show is The Hangry Mexican. And I'm like, well, I do get hangry, but I'm not Mexican. But, you know, I, I'm, uh, it's, uh, I thank you for finding me, um, you know, and, and uh, it was a pleasure being on your show. Uh, I had oh, a lot yeah. of Oh, well, I'm glad to hear it. Uh, yeah, I mean, the name of the podcast, I keep getting uh, a lot of, uh, you know, it's it's one of those things where it's, uh, it kicks up a discussion. So it's it's almost like an icebreaker, which is kind of what I've wanted to. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, and so I've had people tell me the same thing. Oh, well, I mean, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not Mexican. I don't think I can be on that show. I said, no, no, no. Like that's a, that's, that's, that's like a play on words for me, you know, cause that's I am. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> um but yeah it's uh you know everybody everybody has been there i think it's not just me where you know you're uh happy go lucky and then uh, one moment you start getting hungry and if you don't get food soon it's not pretty <laughs> you get hungry and i've had exactly. many of those moments so yeah <laughs> Well, we'll we'll uh, have to get you a family sized bag of Cheetos along with some pumpkin spice in the care package. No, I looked up the. I even I was so desperate. I looked up the price for because uh, they don't have flaming hot Cheetos here. Uh, so the the last time I made, you know, my parents went to the U.S. They were like, "What were you? What do you want?" Um, and I told them to get me like twenty five packets of flaming hot <laughs> Cheetos in their suitcase. This is not a joke. Um, I was uh, so they they actually brought me. Uh, 25, 30 packets of, of Flaming Hot Cheetos. And now I actually ration my, um, you know, my intake of Flaming Hot Cheetos uh, so that, you know, I never run out. And then by the time they go to the U.S. again, they can just buy me a fresh supply. And um, they were like, pre, you know, like three grad degrees later, you're working now. And, you know, the, the one thing that you want is chips. Are you are you for real? So I'm like, oh, yeah, that's how desperate I am. And, you know, I checked the price of if you want to import it or export it to India. The price is like over 100 US dollars to uh, uh, get Flaming Hot Cheetos here. So and I was almost about to pay it, too. So, oh, my goodness. You know, you know I think what you, what you should do. <laughs> I will welcome that without any complaints. <laughs> Maybe what you can do is get a suitcase that's empty and just have it have them fill it all the way up. And and I think uh, you can go up to 50 pounds and you only pay, I think, 25 or 30 dollars to check in that suitcase. You get more, right. Like for because it's it's like over 100 dollars to import just one bag of chips. So if you like actually travel and like take that suitcase with you and fill it up and even pay for like the overweight of the Cheetos. You'll still it'll still be cheaper than actually importing it into the country. Yeah, exactly. Wow, I'm I'm so you know it's pathetic that I know this, but I have no shame. So it's <laughs> that's how awesome flaming hot Cheetos are. So oh man, yeah, uh, you know there's um, something about the spiciness of them all that that just oh, it's you it feels so it. good on the tongue, even even though your body might be paying for it later, but. It's just so good. 
turns, right? And I've had instances where I've eaten the bag of chips and gone to play on top of that. And your stomach is just screaming at you and it's burning and you're just like, but it was totally worth it. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, man. Well, all right. Well, Priyanka, thank you so much for joining me on the podcast today. And uh, we'll have to have you back again and we'll we'll have to talk more Cheetos next time. Oh, it would be an honor. Thank you so much, Oscar, for having me. I had fun. My thanks again to Priyanka Deo for taking some time out of her uh, busy schedule and just sitting down and having a, a, a chat with me. Um, and uh, hopefully our listeners got a chance to learn something new, get inspired uh, to get out, get up, go out and, and, and make something, uh, make their dreams come true and, and maybe inspire others. Uh, and if you want to follow Priyanka again on Twitter, she's at Priyanka Deo. And on Instagram, search for Priyanka Deo. Uh, And of course, on uh, Facebook, you can follow her on her Facebook page uh, by searching for Priyanka Deo or by using the Facebook handle It's Priyanka Deo. All right. Of course, all those links will be in the description below. So be sure to check that out. Be sure to check out her show. uh, New India Junction, uh, a, a great show, by the way, and uh, very, very inspiring. Uh, and if you enjoyed this episode, you like the podcast, awesome. I would love to hear from you. Uh, send in your uh, comments and questions to uh, Hungry Mexican Podcast at gmail dot com. I would love to feature some of those in future episodes, and also tell your family and friends. Let's get uh, more ears on this podcast. And, and uh, you know, if you can do me a favor, go to the Apple podcast and just rate the, uh, the epi- uh, well, the episode there, but also the podcast and, and comment. And that would be, that would be uh, uh, really great. <laughs> uh, we are on all major platforms, of course. So you can listen to The Hangry Mexican uh, wherever you get your podcast on the drive to work, on the drive home, before you go to bed, uh, whenever and wherever. And until next time, everybody, I hope you're all having a great week. Good night and good luck.